engineering behind the greatest supercar ever. It was a hypercar before hypercars were even a thing. The McLaren F1. It was the fastest production car in the world for 12 straight years. That's from kindergarten to the end of high school. You done graduated and the fastest car in the world hasn't changed. Thanks to our friends at Audible for sponsoring today's episode of Bumper to Bumper. At this point, we are all suffering from screen fatigue. I mean, you can only stare at Zach Job's dreamy eyes on social media for so long. Between Job's baby blues and writing all these B2Bs, my eyes, they're tuckered out, they're tired. But my ears, oh, they're ready for listening. I've been using Audible to listen to some of my favorite books lately. Right now, I'm listening to Hell's Angels, the strange and terrible saga of the outlaw motorcycle gangs. Now, Audible has helped me, and they're taking strides to help everyone during these times of adjustment. They recently launched stories.audible.com, which offers free titles to help parents limit screen time with children, or really anyone for that matter, with no sign up required. That's awesome. And then, then, once you're all tuckered out from listening to all your audiobooks, just pop on over to Audible Sleep to calmly drift off. Maybe I should record some sleepy time audio clip. Hello everyone. Hope that you're having a nice night. Ready to get, get in your pajamas? Hmm. That sound good? Oh, a little, a little chain slide. Good night. So visit audible.com slash bumper to bumper or text bumper to bumper to 500 dash 500 for a free audiobook. That's audible.com slash bumper to bumper. And thank you guys, seriously, thank you so much for supporting the companies that support Donut. So today, we're gonna break down the engineering masterpiece that is the McLaren F1. We're gonna first find out why it uses that unique three-seater design. And then we'll look at the first ever carbon fiber monocoque road-going chassis. Then, will dive into the 620 horsepower, naturally aspirated B12 that is still one of the most powerful naturally aspirated engines 25 years later. Oh, and how can I forget? You look at it and it uses gold in the engine compartment. And it's not just for show, it's there for a good reason. And we're gonna find out why. I want the gold, give me the gold. <laughs> Now looking at the exterior of the McLaren F1, compared to today's supercar standards, it looks, dare I say, conservative? But pop open the dihedral doors and look inside and you'll see what really separates this British boy from any other car out there. And that is, it's got three seats. And the main brain behind the F1, Gordon Murray, he dreamed of a three-seater sports car since he was a kid, and now he had his chance to build one. So the more important question is, why a center seat? Well, Mr. Murray went off and drove every supercar he could get his hands on during the early stages of the F1's design, and they all shared a common engineering flaw, offset pedal box, meaning the pedals were never directly in front of the driver's hips. They were always moved over a little bit. And for someone who's a perfectionist, that is a problem. And an easy way to fix that is to put the pedal box in the middle and therefore the seat in the middle. And with the driver's feet centered between the wheel wells, he can square his hips to the car's center line with straight legs. None of this turning your hips nonsense while you're driving your super cool sports car. There are some other benefits to having a centrally located seat. One is visibility. When you're in the center position and you're pushed forward, you have a greater view of the road. And for tall people like myself, you have more headroom. That's really nice. And if we're talking about performance, we just need to look at the greatest four wheel machines ever built. Yep, that's right. We're talking about go karts. Heck yeah. Okay, yes, and Formula One cars. Now there's a reason McLaren named this car the F1, because a lot of the technology in this car comes from Formula One, the seat position being just one aspect. Now I weigh about 180 pounds soaking wet, that's 82 kilograms, and the F1 weighs in about 2,500 pounds. That means my body weight is about 7% of the total weight of the car and driver package, and it's placed directly along the center line. And if you think about it, 
Unlike most cars, the weight of the driver has a greater effect on the weight distribution of a car that's as light as the F1. Your fat buns account for more of that total car-driver combo. So if three seats is such a good thing, why don't more cars use them? Well, airbag system regulations make it much harder to design a car that can meet those standards. Not that it would matter, because the F1 didn't use them anyways. I mean, this car doesn't have a lot of things you think a supercar would have. There's no traction control, there's no ABS, no power steering, there's no electronic aids to help you not crash one. Now, one of the greatest comedians to ever grace this planet, you know who I'm talking about, you get where I'm going here, he crashed his twice. I'm talking about Mr. Bean. Some people call him Rowan Atkinson, but for this, I'm sure his real name's Mr. Bean. Now another cool engineering tidbit is that the seat is in a permanently fixed position as are the pedals, the shifter, and the steering wheel. Now McLaren would measure you and place those items in your preferred seating position. No power seats in the F1. Those electronic motors used to adjust power seats, they just add weight. Which leads me to my next point, and that is, how did they build a car that was so light? <laughs> I'm gonna start off with the carbon fiber monocoque because it's the biggest item on this list. And it's essentially one large body panel that all your other components attach to. And more importantly, from a structural standpoint, both the tensile and compressive forces are carried through the skin of the monocoque. So to show you how strong they are, come on, come on, let's get in the back of the old Jerry bus and let's take a trip to, to my kitchen, come on. I'm Jerry, the guy from before. And in my hand, I have a monocoque. I have, ooh, a little egg. And this egg is incredibly strong given how little material there is in the shell. So I want you to do something. I want you to go to your own kitchen. And ask your mom, say, hey mom, I need your eggs for science. Come back here, I'll wait. Okay, you got an egg, great. I want you to take this egg. I want you to take your hand and I want you to wrap it around the egg like that and I want you to squeeze as hard as you can. You're gonna be thinking, hey Jerry, while I do that, I'm gonna break it, I'm gonna get egg all over the place. I guarantee you, you will not be able to crack it, okay? So do this and squeeze. <laughs> What's really interesting is that just like a monocoque chassis, this egg is extremely strong. It can take all that compressive forces. Let's see, when you wrap your hand around it, all the forces are equally distributed throughout the shell. I'm sweating like a pig too, it's hot as <laughs> And just like this egg, a monocoque chassis doesn't need a lot of extra material in order for it to be able to withstand all those compressive and tensile forces. All that, all that pushing and all the weight and all the stress that it's causing when you're driving it, doesn't need a lot of big bulky parts for it. It can carry it just like this egg can carry it. And with the F1, the entire monocoque weighs just over 220 pounds. It's made using 48 individual molds with over 5,000 pieces of pre-preg carbon fiber cut using templates so that each piece is exactly the same as the last. Now we talked a lot about pre-preg carbon fiber in a previous episode of B2B, the Speed Core Challenger. Go back after this episode and watch it, it's a good one. But a quick reminder, carbon fiber cloth has a high tensile strength. That's this, it's really hard to pull apart, but it's really easy to damage. Think about it, you can take a pair of scissors, you cut right through carbon fiber cloth. Now polymer resin, on the other hand, they're weak in tensile strength, but they're really tough. So when you combine their powers, yeah, you get carbon planet. He's our hero. He's gonna bring weight down to zero carbon planet. Almost seems like it's bad. Now the end result is a material that is twice as strong as steel, but five times lighter. Okay, so you got those specifically cut pieces of carbon fiber and they're moved over into a clean room where they're placed in a mold. And once they're placed in the mold, certain parts get an aluminum honeycomb core mm, added between them. And this is to increase rigidity without adding a bunch of weight. Now, depending on what sections of the monocoque need more strength, those particular sections of the F1's chassis are up to 17 layers thick. Also, throughout the monocoque, inserts are placed into the carbon fiber to form edges and mount fittings. Remember, stuff has to bolt up to this monocoque chassis, so you have to have spots that you can run bolts into. Now, the individual pieces are then bagged and then they're vacuum sealed. And the reason they do this is because you want to keep the carbon fiber pressed up against the mold. 
Now this prevents voids in the layer and small pinholes on the surface of the carbon fiber. You'll see in real crappy carbon fiber, there'll be like little, little dots on the ends. They didn't want that in the F1, they were seeking perfection. So you take these vacuum sealed bag pieces and you put them in an almost 10 foot wide autoclave to cook. And that autoclave, it heats up to 125 degrees C with 90 PSI pressure, where it sits there and cooks for three hours. And that heat and pressure cure the epoxy resin and turn it from a flexible plastic into a rock hard plastic. Now using pre-made jigs with holes marked out where they need to drill, they drill specific holes while another engineer or worker, they abraze the joints by hand. And abraze, this is a fancy word, it means they just scuff it up. And when you abraze a surface, what you do is you're increasing the amount of surface area so that when they glue those pieces together, it forms a solid bond. That's right. The McLaren F1's monocoque is glued together. Even the pattern and how they apply the glue is specific to give the bond the highest joint strength. The monocoque is even assembled upside down so that gravity, it'll help push all the pieces together, making sure that glue makes really good contact. And what's even more impressive is that McLaren was doing this with their Formula One car in the MP4-1 in 1981. Now, 10 years later, they were using that tech to build their first ever road car. Now, one of the more unique parts of the monocoque is the front crash structure, and it uses carbon fiber and a material called Dynama or Dynama. And it's an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And this stuff is really, really cool. Now it's a plastic and it's spun into a fiber and then woven into a cloth that's combined with sheets of carbon fiber. Now when they did crash testing, yes, they had to crash some of them. They slammed one into a wall at 30 miles per hour and it didn't even break the windshield. And remember, the engine's not in the front of the F1, it's in the back. So you don't have the engine quote unquote protecting you in a front end collision. Now speaking of engines, let's talk about natural aspiration. You're not gonna use that one, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> The naturally aspirated 6.1 liter V12 made by BMW wasn't McLaren's first choice when they were out shopping for an engine in their F1. They went to Honda and asked for a 4.5 liter V10 or V12, dealer's choice, but Honda didn't really follow up, which was weird because they were the ones supplying the engines for the McLaren Formula One team at the time. Now BMW at the time had a five liter V12 in development, but it was too heavy and it didn't rev high enough. Also, Murray, he had a crap ton of specifications for the engine. It had to have 100 horsepower per liter, minimum 550 horsepower. It couldn't be longer than 600 millimeters. It had to rev to 7,500 RPM. It could weigh at max 550 pounds, two Nolans. It had to be rigid enough to be load bearing structural member. It had to have dry sump oil so he could mount the engine lower and also avoid oil surge during cornering. And with all that in mind, BMW came up with quite possibly the most beautiful engine ever made, the S70 slash two. Now the head and block were cast aluminum alloy. It had double overhead cams with a version of BMW's variable valve timing called the Vanos, V-A-N-O-S. Now it's a hydraulically actuated phasing mechanism that retards the inlet cam relative to the exhaust cam at low revs. And that reduces the valve overlap. That's when the exhaust valve is closing and the intake valve is opening or vice versa. Now this gives the car better idle stability and increased low speed torque. Now in the case when the revs get higher, that's not all that good. So the valve overlap is actually increased from 25 degrees to 42 degrees. And this change in timing increases the airflow into the cylinders, which creates better throttle response and more power. This car gets amazingly good gas mileage, actually. It gets something like 22 miles per gallon. And adding to its throttle response is that each cylinder gets its own individual throttle body. 12 throttle bodies, 12 butterfly valves, 12 raging stiffies. Woo! 
Now, when you push the pedal down in an engine with a single throttle body, that air has to travel further to reach each cylinder, which slows down the engine's response. Now, with 12 throttle bodies, you get that air into the cylinder much quicker. You go into the cylinders, the bores are coated in nicocil, and that's an electro-deposited lipophilic nickel matrix silicon carbide coating. Okay, let's all say it together. Okay, nicocil is electro an electro-deposited lipophilic nickel matrix silicone carbide coating. Coding. Coding. Great. Now go look up each one of those words. I'm not gonna give y'all homework. Are you kidding me? Go take your bicycles out and hop curbs. Throw water balloons at cars. Don't do that. No, no. <laughs> now those are a lot of chemistry related words, but what you should take away from that is that it reduces friction on the piston rings. It makes it slippery. Now even the placement of the cylinders in the V12 is impressive. Remember, this engine couldn't be any longer than 600 millimeters. So the cylinders themselves were only three millimeters from each other. That is super tied in, that's super compact. Now coming out of the chambers is an exhaust made of Inconel. And if you've never heard of that, good, because neither had I. <laughs> and why Inconel? Well, under high heat, which is the operating state of an exhaust system, it has a high fatigue and tensile strength. So why would you want an exhaust to have those strength properties? Well, in addition to it also having silencers, it has another reason for being strong, and that's because it acts as a rear impact absorber. Your exhaust is basically a strength piece that prevents someone slamming into you and damaging a whole bunch of stuff. That's wild, man. Now the engine created so much heat that they had to line the engine bay with a super efficient heat reflecting material. You know where I'm getting at, gold foil. There's roughly 16 grams of gold foil used in this car. Now the most electronics heavy bit on the McLaren F1 is its diagnostic computer. This car, uses a 14.4K modem, which you can hook a laptop up to, and then you can look at all the error codes that it records to the ECU. Now, I had a Dreamcast once that had a 56K modem. Now, McLaren and Gordon Murray have since separated. They've gone their own ways, but both of them are right now working on their next-gen three-seater supercars. You got Gordon Murray, he's got the T50. It's gonna be another analog, naturally aspirated, three-seater car, and then you got McLaren, and they got their Speed Tail, which is gonna be their three-seater sports car. The McLaren F1 was the last great analog supercar, which sounds kind of counterintuitive. How can a machine with such engineering greatness that would stand the test of time be considered analog? Well, because the engineers designed the mechanical pieces so well that they didn't need a bunch of fancy electronics. But McLaren themselves, they're a wild company. Go watch this up to speed on McLaren. Also, on behalf of the whole donut crew, we want to give a big birthday shout out to SEN Rydra. It's 10th birthday. It's a big one. He's a big fan of ours. So thank you for watching SEN. The world is just at your fingertips, man. Happy birthday.